Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Courtney Hilton. I am a research fellow in the School of Psychology at the University of Auckland. Um, and it's great to be speaking as part of this symposium today. Um, of course, uh, I am not able to join in person, unfortunately. I, I, I wish I could, um, but I'm nonetheless glad to be uh, here remotely with you all uh, today. Um, so my aim in this talk today is to describe a somewhat musical picture of rhythmic structure in language and to motivate how this might be interesting from the perspective of aesthetics and the analysis of language in you know, poetry and song. Um, and I'll suggest one potentially interesting way to study this empirically. Um, okay, so, you know, what is linguistic rhythm? Um, well, the typical view focuses on the uh, assignment of metrical stress patterns, i.e., you know, syllables that are more or less prominent based on their position in, in the words and phrases they are part of. Um, and there's a whole subdiscipline of prosodic and metrical phonology and linguistics that propose rules that describe this kind of stress pattern placement for various languages and so on. Um, and while I, uh, I think this approach is valuable, um, I, I think it does tend to oversimplify in um, an important way. And it simplifies what I think is a more complex reality of linguistic rhythm as a dynamic and psychological perceptual process. Um, and you know, this, this simplification might be justified in some situations, depending on what you're interested in, of course. Um, but for the purposes of the aesthetic possibilities of linguistic rhythm in poetry and song and so on, um, I will especially argue here that this simplification misses something important. Um, a uh, more nuanced picture of linguistic rhythm, in my view, and a more musical approach, um, recognizes firstly that there are several sources of rhythmic uh, accent in language, and these can be broadly broken up into two different categories, either those that are external or, you know, signal based, based in the acoustic signal, such as amplitude or pitch based accents, um, uh, or uh, those that are internal or expectation based. Um, uh, and, and these latter kinds of cognitively internal rhythmic cues um, are, of course, not to be found in the acoustic speech signal, but are imposed top down by our minds when we perceive language in particular contexts. For example, uh, we tend to perceive low probability unexpected words as being more prominent than they actually are acoustically. Um, and perhaps this reflects some sort of attentional orienting mechanism or something like this. Um, and well, what I'll be focusing on today is another example where we, uh, you know, tend to effectively hallucinate uh, accentuation patterns in words and phrases in places that would be expected in typical speech, even when there is no acoustic evidence for that accent in the actual speech signal. Um, and I'll be particularly focusing on how uh, syntactic expectations, uh, expectations about the, you know, the syntax of the sentence, um, influence our perception of metrical rhythm. Um, but before I get into that, um, the reason I uh, am interested um, <clears throat> in there being, you know, these multiple different types of rhythmic cues is that these cues don't always have to line up with each other. Um, you know, rather I contend that there are interesting aesthetic affordances when different sources of rhythmic cues play against each other and don't align. Um, there's a you know quote from the American uh, composer, mu like music composer Seymour Schifrin, that I quite like, where he says, uh, "Cross accentuation is the lifeblood of rhythm," um, and and what he means here, or at least one interpretation of what he means, is that what makes rhythm interesting in music is precisely the cases where multiple different types of rhythmic cues clash with each other in a kind of satisfying, interesting way, and that the dynamics of these conflict, conflicting cues makes for this kind of aesthetic rhythmic interest. Um, you know, sometimes this is also called syncopation in, in music theory. Um, and, you know, while, while this view is uh, somewhat well accepted in the realms of uh, music theory and analysis and the likes, um, I feel like, you know, this kind of idea, at least in the ways that I'll be talking about it 
um, you know, a, a less explored in language. Um, and so the, the point of this talk is not to provide detailed analysis of this with, you know, in, in poetry or song, as this is not really my uh, area of expertise. You know, I'm more of an experimental cognitive psychologist who focuses on music. Um, but what I will do is talk through an aspect of actually one of my old PhD studies that kind of helps demonstrate, I think, maybe some of the potential of this kind of approach and, and maybe some methodologies that could be interesting for looking at this um, kind of cross accentuation or linguistic syncopation in, empirically. Um, in particular, yeah, so the, uh, this, this paper here, um, published back in 2021 uh, in the journal Cognition, um, uh, and so, you know, I'm not going to go over all the details of the study here, but the essence of it can be grasped from uh, this demo here, which I'll play for you in a second, um, uh, where some artificially generated speech spoken in a boring monotone, um, you know, to a steady beat. And, you know, it's, it's a pretty boring speech example, but I just want you to to listen to it and in particular pay attention to your um, rhythmic experience of, of, of this. So here we go. And I, I hope you the sound comes through fine. The boy that the girl helped got an A on the test. Okay, so, um, you know, again, it's not the most interesting sentence. Um, uh, but what I'd like to draw your attention to is how you actually might have heard a particular accentuation pattern in that sentence that perhaps looked like the this. The boy that the girl helped got an A on the test. Um, and what's interesting here, and of course doing this, uh, you know, remotely pre-recorded, I can't, you know, uh, respond to your own perceptions of this. Um, but for me, at least, uh, I, I, per I perceived that kind of accentuation pattern there demonstrated with the little red text and the arrows um, quite clearly, despite the fact that there are no acoustic cues for that accentuation pattern in the actual speech signal. The speech itself is just purely monotone. There are no acoustical, there are no amplitude or you know, pitch accents in, in that speech to, to give those accents. And yet you heard them, or at least I'm presuming you, you, you did. Um, and the point here is that those accents you heard were actually driven by the syntax of the sentence. and your um, ability as a, uh, you know, fluent or maybe at least somewhat fluent comprehender of English um, and your knowledge of where stress patterns tend to fall within syntactic phrases. And in case, you know, you're, you're not kind of convinced of that kind of explanation here, um, here's another version where I've just flipped the order of the words in the sentence. So the same exact sentence in the reverse order um, and Reversing it here, of course, breaks the syntax of the sentence. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, let's see what your rhythmic experience of this is. Test the on A and got helped girl that the boy B. So for me, at least, I didn't hear almost at all any kind of clear rhythmic accentuation pattern there like I did with the other examples. Um, so, you know, again, this maybe helps to um, uh, demonstrate how that syntactic cues in a sentence can actually drive expectations we have about um, rhythmic patterns and that can shape actually what we perceive. Um, now in, in the paper itself I studied how um, uh, aligning or misaligning these kinds of rhythmic expectations with other rhythmic cues uh, can affect sentence comprehension. So, you know, when these cues were aligned with each other, people understood the sentences better. So that is the light yellow um, bars here were always higher than the red bars and similar for, you know, uh, another replication of this. Um, I understand there's a lot of, you know, detail in these plots I'm not getting into um, and that's because it's not really relevant here. Um, uh, uh, but, you know, the broader point is that when these cues align, people understand the sentences better. Um, but what's perhaps more interesting is another aspect of this task where instead of just listening to these sentences, participants in these research studies um, that I ran were um, tapping their finger on a drum pad in time with the sentences in specific specified ways. Um, so let me just demonstrate that for you here. So I'll first do a alignment where I'm tapping in time uh, congruently with the syntax of the sentence. So here we go. 
the boy that the girl helped got an A on the test. Okay. Um, now let's do another version where uh, I'll, it's the same sentence but with a misaligned... Uh, uh, I'll be clapping in time with points in the sentence that are misaligned where the syntactic cues are. The boy that the girl helped got an A on the test. Okay. Um, so, um, what was interesting about that uh, and sort of shown in this figure here um, is that when participants tapped in time with the sentence in a way that was misaligned with the syntactic cues, um, they were less reliable at tapping in time with the sentence. They're more variable in their tapping. Um, so here the uh, light yellow points here, and each point here is the average performance of one of the participants, um, uh, they were least variable for this condition where the tapping was aligned with the syntactic rhythmic cues. Um, uh, but in the condition where it was misaligned, so, you know, this red um, condition here, um, participants were much more variable in tapping in time with that sentence, uh, you know, suggesting a kind of what I've called sometimes a metrical Stroop effect, if you're aware of the classic Stroop effect in psychology. Um, uh, or, or just more broadly, this is a kind of similar to syncopation in music, so that is, if you ask someone to tap their foot in time with a syncopated rhythm in music, people often find that more difficult um, because of, again, the cl clashing of different sorts of rhythmic cues. And that's, I think, what's at play here. So we have this objective measure of the fact that people's internal cues, uh, driven by the syntax of the sentence and their knowledge of that, um, clash with uh, other rhythmic cues and driving them to tap less reliably in time with the sentence. Okay, so, you know, um, what does this all mean? So, you know, uh, uh, while my research has gone in a different direction than this since my PhD, I think there's some interesting potential to use this kind of sentence tapping paradigm to empirically measure people's internal expectation-based rhythmic cues via measuring how they affect the variability of tapping in time with sentences like this. Um, and, you know, what's interesting about these cognitively internal rhythmic cues as opposed to acoustical external cues is that they are dependent on our linguistic knowledge. So, you know, a baby yet to learn language will be sensitive to external acoustic cues, but they will be insensitive to these kinds of, you know, syntactic rhythmic cues. Um, indeed, a prominent theory in language acquisition is that babies start to learn the syntax and grammar of the language that they're learning uh, by inferring certain aspects of it from the acoustical rhythmic patterns in, in speech. Um, and this is called the prosodic bootstrapping hypothesis. Um, and actually, this is, this is likely why infant-directed speech, which is something I've studied before, is more rhythmically organized compared to normal speech. And, you know, in this study, we looked at this, along with many other things, across a really diverse number of cultures around the world. And, you know, we find that um, infant-directed speech and infant-directed song tends to be more rhythmically clear and predictable, um, perhaps in part to support um, that kind of learning of the language, um, this kind of pedagogical function. Um, but, you know, as we become adults, as we become fluent speakers, we no longer need this kind of rhythmic scaffold. And this opens up the possibility for more aesthetic, uh, you know, possibilities for rhythm in you know, poetry and song um, and uh, making use of these clashes between external acoustically driven rhythmic cues and internally, uh, you know, linguistic knowledge driven um, rhythmic cues from like, you know, syntax or word predictability or something like this. Um, and that can drive rhythmic interest. Um, and I think this has some interesting poetic implications, although I'm certainly no expert in poetry, um, but I did chat to my old landlord, Robert Pinsky, uh, who also happens to be a three-time uh, poet laureate of the United States, and most importantly has, a, has appeared on The Simpsons. Pinsky, you've done it again. <laughs> Um, uh, but, you know, uh, what I find really interesting chatting to him and engaging with his poetry more generally, which I've become quite fond of, 
is his quite deliberately musical approach to rhythm in language and, and in his poetry. Um, indeed, he often uh, gives so-called poem jazz performances where he performs his poetry live accompanied with jazz musicians. Um, and he, like me, finds the more traditional rhythmic analysis of poetry through identifying primary and secondary stresses and so on to you know, completely miss the vitality of poetic rhythm and the kind of more musical aspects of this. Um, yeah, so I'll be interested to hear from the audience of presumably people uh, more versed in poetry than I about your thoughts about using, uh, about, you know, analyzing poetic rhythm um, uh, in this kind of more musical way that uh, recognizes a more dynamic interplay between both, uh, you know, external acoustic rhythmic cues and internal kind of linguistic uh, rhythmic cues. Um, and, you know, maybe the possibility of measuring these kinds of internal uh, uh, rhythmic cues with paradigms like my rhythmic tapping paradigm that I showed you today. So um, with that, you know, I thank you for your attention and I, you know, very much look forward to your questions. Thanks.